Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Hello from Hong Kong, David Gura. What ha? Hello from New York. It is great to talk to you across the ocean. And it looks like, if I squint here and look at my Zoom screen, you're having dinner in the studio. Very good eyes. I am, and it's at the heart of our episode today. It explains the rocking global currency markets right now. Let me show you what I'm having okay. so you can drool over it through Zoom. This is torture. <laughs> Let me see here. See if you can see this. Can you see? Look at that chopsticks in hand and it looks like a dumpling. Is it a dumpling? It is, but it's not just any dumpling, David. This is a Shaolong Bao, a soup dumpling, right? It's got Uh yummy broth inside. And it's from a famous Taiwanese restaurant called Din Tai Fung. They've got branches in New York and here in Hong Kong, all over the world. And let me get this straight. Their soup dumplings are behind what's rocking the global currency markets? They are, in a way. Okay. I'll let Shuli Ren explain. She's a Bloomberg opinion columnist who covers Asian markets. Yes. So the Xiaolongbao index is kind of like the Big Mac index. It has all the purchasing power of the world's biggest uh, cosmopolitan cities. Ding Taifeng was uh, expanding outside of Taiwan and opening uh, restaurants in the biggest, uh, most posh cities. And the idea is that uh, if you look at the global cosmopolitans like Dubai, Hong Kong, Singapore, London, New York, the cost of uh, Xiaolongbao should be the same. And it turns out they can be quite different. So, David, we would have ordered you some dumplings from the Din Tai Fung in New York. Very thoughtful. But apparently, <laughs> <laughs> but apparently they don't do takeout or delivery. And get this, you have to book seats at midnight A month in advance. A month in advance. My gosh, how good are these dumplings? They are very delicious. Luckily for us here in Hong Kong, they're much easier to get a hold of. So I use the equivalent of 10 US dollars to buy Din Tai Fung dumplings. Uh And I got around six Shaolong Baos, right? And even though we didn't manage to get dumplings delivered to you in the studio there, (laughs) we, we did, we will at some point. We did look up the price and get this, you'd only get about five dumplings. Only five. Only five. But in Tokyo, once you traded your 10 U.S. dollars for Japanese yen, you get around eight dumplings. Okay, so 10 U.S. dollars goes further in Japan, and I guess that's a sign that maybe the yen is just a little bit undervalued. Oh, I get it. This is all about all of the carry trade news. That's right. Carry trades, right? Uh They're pretty technical, inside market stuff. You don't usually hear it in the broader news. But recently, a whole bunch of carry trades went south and took the markets with them. Yeah, I've watched the value of the yen rise quite a bit against the dollar, and that hammered a bunch of these trades. That's right. Not to mention, it left a lot of investors with balance sheets that looked a little bit like, you know, the watery (laughs) inside of a soup dumpling here. (laughs) So today, as part of our ongoing series, Bloomberg Explains, we're talking about carry trades, how they work, what went wrong, and why it hammered global markets. I'm Juan Ha. And I'm David Gura, and this is The Big Take Asia from Bloomberg News. So David, the news has been full of carry trades lately. They've been making a lot of headlines. Yeah, they're new to a lot of people, but the trades themselves have a long history. Here's Shuli Ren again, a Bloomberg columnist who covers Asian markets. Carry trade has been going on for a long time. It's really simple. It's basically taking out cheap loans from countries that have very low interest rate. And then uh, investors in turn exchange it into another currency and invest in countries that have uh, much higher yielding assets. I've got a really simple example. David, let's say I borrow $1,000 worth of Japanese yen from a Japanese bank. Let's say you're that bank. Okay, I'll lend you that 1000 and I'm going to charge you a little interest for that loan. And in Japan, it's very little interest, right? So for a long time, the Bank of Japan's main interest rate was basically zero. Now, assuming I get that rate, I'll convert this money I've borrowed into U.S. dollars and lend out that money at around 5.5%, which is the rate in the U.S. at the moment. Now, this sounds like a pretty good deal for you. It is. Now, when the person I lent money to pays back my loan, I get back that $1,000 plus interest. Let's say it's $1,060. Now, you pay me back the $1,000 I lent you, but I didn't charge any interest or very little interest. And assuming, and this is a big assumption here, that the exchange rate stays the same, when you pay me back, you get to keep that 60 bucks. Right. Not a bad profit, right? 
Not at all. And that there is the appeal of the yen carry trade. It's got a funny name. Why is it called a carry trade? It's an esoteric name. The traders like to use the word carry. Basically, carry means earning interest rate differentials. And you're essentially carrying that until you make a profit. Yes, like you're carrying a baby. It's like a pregnancy <laughs> carrying yeah. a baby. <laughs> a little profit baby, the kind the markets really love. As Shuli said, the carry trade has been around for a long time, but... The most famous carry trades are done by the Japanese retail investors, the so-called Mrs. Watanabe. The so-called Mrs. Watanabe refers to Japanese housewives. It's kind of hard to trace when the term started to first be used, but we do know that the newspaper The Economist popularized the current use in the late 1990s. That's when the Bank of Japan, desperate to stimulate economic activity, turned to a policy of keeping interest rates near zero, or even, get this, negative. So the Mrs. Wontonabis, they will be actually managing the family wealth, right? And then they know that uh, you cannot put money in the bank because you're not getting any interest uh, in return. So what they do is that uh, they, they invest their money in other countries, and they were actually quite adventurous. They will buy Mexican peso, uh, Turkish lira, Indonesia rupia. These are all the emerging market currencies that uh, they can earn higher interest rate from. But it wasn't just the Mrs. Watanabe's who saw opportunities with the weak yen. The yen carry trade in its various permutations is now carried out by hedge funds, investment firms, and traders all over the world. And these trades have only gotten bigger and more popular in the past few years as the Japanese yen has weakened against other currencies. You could get more yen for your dollar or your euro or pound sterling. Or more soup dumplings. Fair enough. <laughs> That's right. And just like the soup dumplings, people were saying that the yen was undervalued a great deal for investors. So they began to borrow even more yen and use that money to fund all kinds of trades, according to Shuli. Now, some economists say that carry trade is a strategy that really shouldn't work. What do they mean by that? Economists like to look at things in the long term. And basically, they will say the value of a currency should reflect its uh, purchasing power at home and uh, uh, the interest rate that it earns. So In the purchasing power parity situation, it doesn't matter whether you hold the Japanese yen or the U.S. dollar. You will be able to get the same amount of goods. But as we've demonstrated, clearly there isn't parity. And that's why you can get more soup dumplings in Tokyo compared to New York. And it's also why the Japanese yen has been a popular currency for carry trades. But it's far from the only currency that can be used to make a carry trade. It can be anything. Any currencies that have lower interest rates can be used as a funding currency. For instance, like uh, say perhaps a decade ago, the U.S. dollar was not yielding any interest rates, right? And there was a very popular funding currency for traders to buy into emerging market currencies such as the Indonesian rupiah, the Turkish lira, and the Mexican peso. And it's really hard to know how much money is parked in carry trades because they're conducted via currency transactions that aren't easy to track. Not to mention, there's no one central authority keeping tabs. This lack of transparency was one contributing factor to the market turmoil this summer, because no one knew just how much money was in yen carry trades and how many positions would need to be unwound. And if we know one thing about markets, David, it's that they hate uncertainty. After the break, we'll look at whether this summer's meltdown has stopped the rising popularity of carry trades. Or if they'll carry on. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Sorry, couldn't resist. So to recap, one of the most popular carry trades of the past few years was the yen carry trade. When investors all over the world were making a ton of money borrowing Japanese yen at an interest rate of almost zero, and then lending it out for a profit or investing it. Basically, as long as Japan kept its interest rate near zero, and again, this is the key point, as long as the yen was undervalued, these yen carry trades were reliable, little profit machines. What possibly could go wrong? 
Coming into the meeting, we actually had economists surveyed by Bloomberg thinking that the consensus would be no change in the interest rate policy. But then this morning, we woke up to news that they were discussing a rate hike. Surprise, so surprise. Sort of- the Bank of Japan raised the interest rate by 25 basis points. And that caught a lot of people by surprise. Oh, my goodness. It's it's a awful time, I think, to be at the Bank of Japan right now because they are in the between a rock and a hard place. I mean, they have been... Now, to be clear, an interest rate of 0.25% is very low compared to most countries. But that's not the only thing that happened. The yen strengthened against a basket of currencies at nearly its fastest pace in two decades. So a combination of the Fed cutting rates with the Bank of Japan raising rates and a strengthening yen led to panic selling uh, and the brokers started to give out margin calls and uh, a lot of uh, hedge funds had no choice but to unwind their trades. Hedge funds sold stocks in Japan at the fastest pace in more than five years. It is looking ugly out there. Asian equities have been selling off aggressively. This carry trade which seemed like the easy trade is no longer. So you start exiting fast and it starts to be self-fulfilling. Unwinds and unwinds and unwinds. Billions of dollars worth of carry trades went up in smoke. So here's what happened. David, remember that $1,000 loan I took out from you? Yes, I'm running the Japanese bank. I lent Mm you $1,000 worth of yen at basically no interest rate. Right. And then I turned around and loaned that $1,000 out in the U.S. at an interest rate of 5.5%. I remember now, you made 60 bucks, I think. That's right. But now, when I borrow money from you, I won't pay an interest rate of zero. I'll have to pay you 0.25% on that loan. Well, 0.25% is still a lot lower than 5.5%, so you would make less money, but it does seem like you'd still make money, right? Well, you would be right about that, except that something else happened when Japan raised interest rates. The value of the yen went up by a lot. So when you convert your U.S. dollars back to yen to pay me back for that loan I gave you, your U.S. dollars aren't worth as much. A thousand U.S. dollars doesn't buy as much yen as it used to. Exactly. So when I pay back that thousand dollar loan, I might have to pay more like eleven hundred dollars now. So between a higher interest rate from me and your dollars buying fewer yen, that 60 bucks you made in profit on your carry trade is basically gone. Vanished, if I'm lucky. (laughs) I might actually now have lost money on this carry trade. Shuli Ren said it's like that famous Warren Buffett quote about what happens to people who haven't prepared for market change. So basically, it's like a tide coming to the beach nonstop, and then that tide suddenly receded, and we got to see who was swimming naked, basically. We actually see that the yen's movement was highly correlated with the movement of Nasdaq. So Japan's currency is affecting U.S. stock market. For a long time, carry trades were mostly done via bonds and other currencies, like the yen peso carry trade. But over the past few years, traders have been borrowing yen to buy American tech companies, juicing their returns which was why the decision to unwind those trades sparked a sell-off on the Nasdaq a few weeks ago. Now, there must have been a lot of upset investors when the Bank of Japan raised rates and the markets crashed. Was there a lot of criticism of what the Bank of Japan was doing? Yes, there was a lot of criticism saying that uh, the Bank of Japan was uh, burying its head in the sand, that it was uh, raising interest rates uh, too early. But I have to say that, uh, you know, this one-sided bet on the yen has been going on so long. So it sounds like you think it was bound to happen, this correction. Yes, it was already getting too big. So now that a correction has happened, where does all of this leave the yen carry trade? The carry trade will only get very popular if uh, people can see it's a one-way bet. And uh, that's probably not what the Bank of Japan wants the yen to behave, right? And uh, that that's a problem that other central banks have seen as well. Because if the carry trade is too popular and the central bank suddenly changes uh, its interest rate regime, we will see this kind of violent unwind that we saw in August. So there you go, David, the carry trade. The carry trade. The yen carry trade in particular was going strong on the idea that interest rates in Japan would remain relatively low, even as central banks in the U.S. and the U.K. cut rates. And that would continue to make the yen weak relative to other currencies. So borrowing money would essentially be much cheaper there. In other words, people would be able to pay for five dumplings and get eight. 
Speaking of dumplings, Juan, any chance you could FedEx me some of those dumplings? It doesn't look like I'll get a reservation here in New York anytime soon. That will cost you a little more than $10, David. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go dig into one of these Shaolong Baos before they get cold. You Sorry, have my David. permission. I'm so jealous right now. <laughs> This is the Big Take Asia from Bloomberg News. I'm Wan Ha. And I'm David Gura. For more on the carry trade blow up, you can listen to our sister podcast, Odd Lots. Tracy Alloway and Joe Weisenthal recently spoke with Hyun Sung Shin of the Bank of International Settlements. That's the bank of banks that's been trying to track down just how big the yen carry trade is. You can find that wherever you get your podcasts. This episode was produced by Young Young, Naomi Ng, Jessica Beck, and Alex Ugira who also mixed it. And Kim Gittleson, who also edited this episode, along with Stacey Vanek-Smith, Nicholas Reynolds, and Caitlin Kenny. It was fact-checked by Eddie Dwan. Our senior editor is Elizabeth Ponzo. Nicole Beamsterboer is our executive producer. And Sage Bauman is Bloomberg's head of podcasts. If you like our show, please leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Or tell your friends. It makes a big difference. Thank you, and see you next time.